Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Today, we're gonna to be participating in the Knife Talk Build Along. So the Knife Talk podcast is a knife makers podcast with three hosts, all of which are culinary knife makers. So if you're looking to up your knowledge in the art of knife making, make sure you go and listen to their podcast. They put out this design so that the community can build a knife together. I really like build alongs. I know that Simple Little Life does a good deal of these too. And I always find them a lot of fun because it forces you to build a design that you don't normally build. Now you can go to their website to uh, get this blank sent to you, or you can get a general idea of the dimensions from their YouTube video where they announced the build along. So this is the knife that we're gonna be building today. It's a pretty sweet design. Uh, note that I did make some mistakes when making this knife and I will go ahead and make sure to let you know when I make those mistakes in this video so that you don't repeat them. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our normal narration. Alrighty, so during the intro, y'all saw that we got started. We cut out the design from a piece of paper, then with spray-on adhesive, glued it onto a piece of 1084 bar stock from Alpha Knife Supply and then took that rectangular piece while it was still rectangular with nice flat edges and clamped it up in the mill so that we could mill in the sharpening choil with a one half of an inch end mill. After that, we cut out the design on the bandsaw and then ground the design to its current profile roughly with an old worn 60 grit belt on the two by 72 belt sander. Then, we're bringing it over here to the mini mill again to drill some number 13 holes to accept our Corby fasteners and then some pass through holes here for the epoxy to be able to move around during glue up. Now if I had to do this step again I would drill some much bigger holes in the center of the blade or I would bring it to some wheels in the belt sander and hollow out the tang. The tang and handle of this knife ended up being pretty darn heavy and the balance is definitely in the hand. So we're getting the quench tank ready and the forge started up to heat treat this knife. Now, I did skip a few steps in this video on heat treating this knife, but if you have any questions on how to heat treat 1080, 1084 steel, I put a full tutorial in the cards above on how to heat treat this steel. So we get the blade in there nice and hot. Uh, I actually did a few normalizing cycles I didn't show, and then we quenched it into Parks 50. As you can hear there, the blade is very hard. It skates a file easily. We did pick up a little bit of a warp, and we will mess with that warp in the second tempering cycle, not in the first. You don't want to start clamping your blade and contorting it during the first tempering cycle because you risk breaking a very brittle blade. So we're going to do one tempering cycle at 213 degrees Celsius for two hours, and then we're going to start messing with that warp a little bit. So after we take it out, we cool it to room temperature, and then we're gonna put it in a jig so that it counterbends against its warp during the second tempering cycle. So just using a washer there and a thick piece of flat stock, we counterbend this knife around its warp, put it back into the tempering oven for another two hour tempering cycle at 213 degrees Celsius. And it came out pretty straight after that. I did do a little bit of uh, adjusting in the vise, uh, but really not that much. It came out very flat, and we're gonna go ahead and take it to the surface grinder to get that surface nice and clean. So I've been using this surface grinder a lot now after building it, and I really enjoy using this piece of equipment. It gets a nice finish on the knife, and it also gets a nice even finish across the length of the knife. One thing I will say is that you need to come into this system with a flat knife already, otherwise the magnets will pull out any warps and you'll be chasing your tail. So you can see that's the finish I was able to achieve with a 220 grit cork belt on the machine. I start off with a 120 grit uh, 3 by 79 inch belt from Combat Abrasives and those belts have been working out pretty good for me. Now what you saw me do there is I took a piece of sandpaper to where the edge of this blade is going to be 
And I do that intentionally just to make sure that I knock off any layers of decarb that have been left in the blade since the heat treat. So I get the blade edge nice and smooth. I actually went in to that uh, sharpening choil as well and cleaned it up while I was there. And then we're gonna be on to the grinding. So the first step is to grind to that center line with a very aggressive angle around the 45 degree angle. And then you work that bevel back towards the spine uh, for the rest of the grinding of that side of the knife. So we get a very sharp angle and then slowly work the blade uh, back towards the spine. So you're knocking down that peak over and over again until you have a long grind all the way to the spine of the knife. The initial edge that I put on there with a 45 degree, I'm using a very worn belt for that because otherwise it will destroy the abrasives on your new belt. And then I move to around a 60 grit ceramic belt to do the bulk of the beveling. After that, I move to a 120 grit J-Flex belt so I can overhang it on the platen and get in my plunge lines. So this is error number one. I didn't grind my plunge line far enough back. I wish I would have put that plunge line right in the middle of the sharpening choil, not only from an aesthetic standpoint, but also it would make sharpening easier in the future. I don't have a radius right at uh, the beginning of the edge there. So you'll see that error uh, come back to haunt me later on in this build. After we get the grinding done, I come over to my knife vise and start hand sanding. We're gonna be putting a 600 grit hand sanded finish on this blade. We start off with a 320 grit paper from Rhino Wet, and I'm gonna be grinding this 320 finish at an angle. So we get into the plunge line there, and then we start grinding the whole blade at an angle, about, a, I wanna say almost a 45 degree angle to the center line of the blade. We do this so that when we move up to our next grit of sandpaper, we can determine where the scratches are that we need to get through. Here we move up to the 600 grit and you can kind of see there that there are some 320 grit scratches that I was looking for uh, to make sure that I get all of those angled 320 grit scratches out. So one side here is a 600 grit finish and the other side is the belt finish. The next day I came back, uh, reassembled my workbench here and got started on the other side. So I taped up the side that we completed. I also oiled that side so that any type of uh, you know Windex or, or moisture wouldn't rust that side of the blade. And then I put a little tape on it so that it, we, we wouldn't scratch the finish that we just put on there. So when I'm gonna do a hand satin finish on a blade, I etch my maker's mark a little differently. I go ahead and etch it deep first with DC power and then I hit it with the AC power to make it nice and dark. Now we're gonna move on to our handle scales. We're gonna class this up a little bit and put some red G10 liners in our canvas micarta handles. Uh, these liners are gonna go up against the spine and it's gonna give it a nice uh, classy look. So the first step is to get everything cut out and then we will rough up all of the gluing sides of these pieces. So we'll rough up one side of the G10 and one side of the canvas micarta. Also try to make sure that they're nice and flat uh, before going on to our glue up. In this case, I'll be utilizing Combat Abrasives Rogue Epoxy mainly because of the one hour set time. I wanted to be able to work on these handles in the afternoon and if I use G-Flex in this case, it would be a day before I can get back on this project. So we got these nice and glued up and clamped with spring clamps. Uh, the tension of a spring clamp is just about perfect for this application. You don't want to use a screw clamp in this case, otherwise you could uh, squeeze out that epoxy from your joint. And also note that the same thing is true for when you are gluing uh, handle scales onto a blade. You don't want to be over clamping uh, the blade. What you saw me doing there with the masking tape was just putting a layer of tape on both sides of our blade that we just hand finished. I didn't want to have any chances of getting it nicked or scratched, so that's more of a protection measure than anything else. We got both handle scales nice and flat, and then clamped them up to our blade to use as a drill guide for our number 13 holes for our Corby fasteners. After we have our holes drilled, we mark the outline of the handle and then rough cut this outline out with the bandsaw after which we'll bring it to the belt sander and rough grind out the profile of this 
handle. I like getting fairly close in this step because it saves you time when you have the knife together. So we have the profile done. I put some penciled guidelines in the front and we will be grinding around a 45 degree angle in the front of our handle scales. Uh, you can't get to this spot after the knife is glued up. So you have to be 100% finish in the front side of the knife before glue up. So I bring them up to about a 220 grit belt finish and then move on to 320 grit paper all the way up to 1000 grit on the front of the handle scales here. This is a countersink bit from Pops Knife Supply. If you're gonna be working with Corby fasteners or Loveless fasteners or any type of fastener like that, that's a quarter inch, you need to get one of these bits. It is a very large time saver and it has a perfect uh, counter bore every time. So I then measure the total width of the scales and the blade, take out the depth of my counter bores, and then find out that my Corbys need to be about uh, 304 thousandths of an inch long. Now I want to straddle that measurement. So I want to go a little bit deeper. So 2.8 or 0.28 and then a little bit larger. Uh, you see when I open up that Corby, it can go all the way up to like 370 thousandths. So the point there is I want to straddle the number that I came up with in my calculation so that it gives me a little bit of wiggle room. We're then going to mix up some G-Flex epoxy here. Uh, I mix it for at least 40 seconds and then we start applying it to our handle scales. So I'll apply it to the inside of the handle scales, a little bit in the holes when I push the Corby fasteners in and then you can see that we set the knife in the first set of scales then set the second set of scales on top of that. Now one thing to note when you are working with Corby fasteners, be very careful not to get any glue into the female section of the Corby fastener uh, just because when you put the male section in it could cause it not to mate up completely. You won't be able to screw it down completely. So make sure to take great care and keep the epoxy out of the female section of your Corby fasteners. So then we're going to go on to our major handle shaping here on the belt sander. First thing I do is I bring down the flats to be flat, so the Corby fastener flat with the scale. And then I grind the profile of the knife, trying to get those two scales uh, flat and flush with the spine of the knife. So this can take some time. I would advise using a pretty fresh belt, otherwise you'll be sitting there for a while trying to get it flush. I normally get it as close as I can visually with a high grit belt and then move on to a 220 grit belt to get it all the way so as not to put a lot of big scratches in the spine of my knife. Then you can see that I was demonstrating my motion here. I'm going to be uh, contouring the handle scales along the long axis of this knife to give them a little bit of rounding there as you can see from the front. Then we'll move on to a 220 grit scallop belt to round over all the corners before moving on the hand sanding. And this is the finish straight off of the belt sander. You can see that it's rough, but it's pretty much 80% of the way there. I then start off with some 320 grit sandpaper, and then we move all the way up to a 1000 grit paper. After we get the hand sanding done, I head back over to the belt sander with a, a fine scotch bright belt and I just lightly hit the spine of this knife so that all of the scratches are satin and moving in the same direction. So I find that this really helps clean up uh, the spine of the knife right before it's done. So now we're going to sharpen this knife. So this is one part uh, where the uh, plunge line not coming back to the center of the choil really hurt me. Uh, the edge of the wheel actually dug in a little bit to my plunge line and this is an issue that I don't have when I normally uh, have my sharpening choil centered on my plunge line. So just be aware if you're going to be doing something like this on this type of stone, uh, you may gum up your plunge lines a little bit if you don't have that sharpening choil in the nice uh, in the center of your plunge or the plunge in the center of your sharpening choil or at least behind it. So lesson learned there. I also like the way it looks better with that plunge line coming a little further back. So 
that was the big mistake I made with this knife. Uh, we got it all nice and cleaned up here and waxed. It's sharp, uh, it's serviceable, so this will be my box opener for the next couple of months and we will see how it does. Once again, major shout out to Knife Talk for putting out this build along and also providing us with a very cool profile to work with. If you guys like this video, please hit that like button down below and also consider subscribing to the channel so you'll get notified on fun new content coming up. And with that, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.